Hello and welcome back to the Elite Football Show. My name is Haydar Rabani and I'm your host as ever today. I've got a really exciting and fantastic guest. Simon Edwards, the South American football expert and journalist, is back on the podcast to talk to me about another South American gem. Simon, welcome back. You're back in the UK. How are you doing today? Last time we spoke, you were in Colombia. And uh, yeah, how are things going? Yeah, not too bad. A bit cold, um, but uh, it's nice to be back for a little couple of weeks, visit the family and all that kind of stuff. As long as I can leave at some point, <laughs> we'll have to see uh, with the current situation. But if I can leave, then it will be a great little holiday. If not, uh, then not so much. We shall see. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Guys, I hope you're all safe as well. Hope you're having a nice build up towards Christmas. Make sure you hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. We've got some exciting content coming out after the new year so simon let's jump straight into it moises caicedo is the name that's on everyone's lip at, lips at the moment you're seeing conflicting reports some people are saying the deal is done uh, a lot of the british journalists are saying that personal terms are going to be okay uh, we just you know united just need to wrap a few more to find the details it seems it's going to be five million euros which seems to be a very very good price but uh, the question united fans are asking is what sort of player is he because you're, you're hearing some people say, oh, he's Paul Pogba's replacement. Others are saying he's N'Golo Conte. He's like N'Golo Conte. Um, so, yeah, what sort of player is he? What level is he at at the moment? Would he be slotting straight into the first team? Or would you be doing what Pellistri is doing and playing in the 23s? And um, should United fans be excited about the prospect of him joining the club? Yeah, well, I mean, South American fans are very excited. Um, he's a player who has made incredible strides this year. Um, he began the year as an under-20 club player. Now, he comes from Independiente del Valle, which is a team with a 7,000, 8,000-seater stadium. Um, but it's also a team that got to a Copa Libertadores final in 2016. Um, it won the Sudamericana, the Europa League equivalent, last year. And with Moises Caicedo, they won the under-20 Copa Libertadores uh, this year. So it's a tiny little club in Ecuador, but a club that has been competing and beating the biggest teams in, in South America. With Moises Caicedo, as well as winning the under-20 uh, Libertadores, they also beat Flamengo 5-0 uh, this year, the, the reigning Libertadores champions, a team that went very close against Liverpool. So this is a tiny little club, but probably the best academy in South America. Uh, and they're competing with all of the biggest clubs. Um, they've got a lot of investment in youth development and it's made them one of the forces, consistently one of the best teams in South America. So it's a good place to look. Um, and Man United have obviously been doing their research. Moises Caicedo began the year, as I say, playing for the under-20 team. The, he won the under-20 Copa Libertadores and then a few days later made his full Copa Libertadores debut and scored a long-range strike. Uh, for Independiente del Valle. So he's gone from being, uh, you know, an unknown kid at the start of the year to being one of the better midfielders in South America. Uh, he's now a full Ecuador international. He played in Ecuador's impressive 4-2 win against Uruguay. He played a very important role in their demolition of Colombia. He did a very good job marking up against Lionel Messi. So he's established himself this year is one of Ecuador's most important players. What kind of player is he? Uh, the Kante comparisons, the Pogba comparisons, he's a bit of both. Um, at the start of the year, he was playing as a, as a, a six. He was sitting in front of the defence for the under-20s. Um, when he moved to the first team, he played initially in that role as well, but has since become more of a box-to-box -box number eight. He's... I mean, he's a great, like, he models his game as a young player on, on N'Golo Kante. That's someone he looked up to. Um, and he's also said that he was always a fan of Manchester United. I think uh, the Antonio Valencia link has made that an a popular club in, in Ecuador. Um, but I think he has a lot of uh, game intelligence as well. I mean, that's the thing. He's a, he's a great athlete. He's got a good engine. He can get around the pitch. He's very good at winning the ball. Um, and on the ball, he looks to play progressive passes. He can score some long-range goals. He looks to break the lines with his dribbling and his passing. But the thing for me that makes him a step above a lot of other talented South Americans is his intelligence, um, his ability to find space, his ability to receive the ball deep and then progress it either through a smart pass through the lines, a one-two or some dribbling out. So 
he has experience playing as the deepest in a midfield three, and he has experience playing both as a, a more advanced midfielder in a midfield two or as the kind of number eight in a midfield three. So if Manchester United have... Uh, so I can see him playing the Pogba role in a, in a midfield three, but being perhaps more defensively responsible or at least enjoying... I think Pogba's quite good at his offensive work, but it's not his natural game. Whereas I think Moises Caicedo could either play in front of the defence or play as the second of a midfield three. Not the deepest, not the most advanced, but the one who kind of links everything together. Very interesting. I mean, he sounds sounds like he's had a really steep rise. I mean, in such a short amount of time, you're saying he's a uh, full uh, Ecuador international now. I mean, talking about those positions a little bit more, so you're saying he p- could play. So let's say United at the moment play a 4-2-3-1. Mm-hmm. So United's biggest problem, I'm sure you know this as well, you, you, I'm sure you've seen United, um, but their biggest problem is in that defensive position. So, for example, if you have Bruno Fernandes playing as a 10, let's say Pogba's playing in double pivot, you, we need a defensive player. Could he slot in and be that disciplined player? Is that, is that his natural game or would he be more comfortable next to a more defensive-minded player, let's say a Matic or a McTominay or a new sign-in, and then he'd be the one, as you say, he'd be playing... Not the advanced role, but he'd be more of a box to box. But he'd still be doing his discipline and defensive duties. Yeah, if you look at his um, a game against Colombia, you can you can track all the passes he made. Like it was ninety. His pass completion rate is very high. He's a player who takes risks, but he still has 94 percent pass completion in a lot of games. And against Colombia, you can see the passes he made, and it was literally every single blade of grass on the pitch he made a pass. It was it was the most ridiculous pass completion map I've ever seen in my life. You know, every, it was everywhere. Um, and that was him playing as a number eight. But as he came through and as he was kind of the captain and leader for the under 20s, moving into the, the first team, he played just in front of the defence and he would often drop deeper than the centre backs. Like he would be the last man receiving the ball from the goalkeeper, receiving the ball from the defenders, and then launching those attacks from very deep. So he really is a very, very complete midfielder. Um, he's scored goals. In the opposition penalty box, he scored goals from range, um, playing as this number eight, uh, where he'll work very hard. So I think the Kante comparisons are, are fair in terms of the position he's played. But then you have his technical ability, his ability to move the ball, which again, perhaps draws some of those Pogba comparisons as well. He's a player who likes the ball. In terms of potential weaknesses, um, some people have pointed to maybe being a little bit sloppy in his short passing, like maybe not doing the easy things as crisply as he could. But his ability to do the complicated, his ability to find space and his ability to win possession and progress possession is 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 incredible. And the type of money we're talking about. With Palestri, you can say, OK, he's got the technical ability He's got the creativity. Perhaps it's an interesting project. You bring him in, you work with him, maybe in a year's time, he can adapt to the type of football. With with uh, Moises, we're talking about a player who already has the game intelligence um, to, to give you great confidence that he can very quickly adapt. I think if, if he played tomorrow, he would be OK. I think there's, there's a lot more to come, but you throw him in tomorrow and he would do well. Um, every step up he's made, he's looked better. So when he came into the first team in, in Ecuador, he looked he looked better than we've seen him at the youth level, and he'd been very good. When he played Libertadores, he looked very comfortable. When he played for the Ecuador national team, first half against Argentina was a bit quiet. Second half, he was the guy running the show. And then the following games, he was the main man against an incredibly good Uruguay side, an incredible good Colombia side, a tricky away tie in Bolivia. In the three games, he was a standout player, and those were incredibly impressive Ecuadorian performances and results. So he's elevated the Ecuador national team and they're third in South American qualifying. If he was Argentinian or Brazilian, he would be 40 million. There's no doubt about that. That's really, really exciting. That was my question I was going to ask, but you've covered it already, that could he slot straight in? So do you think police shoes come into 23s? You can see there's a talent there. He looks good on the ball. He's played on the right wing. He's made some nice crosses as well, scored a few goals. Uh, Definitely a lot of potential there, but he's not quite there physically yet i think he might get a few games off the bench and possibly tonight he might be playing uh, in the efl cup which would be really really exciting but looking at kaisedo is could you see him if he joined in january slotting straight into the first team squad look whether they do that or not is another question but i think in terms of a player being prepared um coming directly from south america as a teenager 
I think he has a lot of attributes and qualities, um, both mental and physical, that will, will make that adaption possible. If they did it, I don't think it would be a problem. You know, it would be a big challenge for the player. Uh, he would perhaps not immediately dominate the game as he does in South America. You know, he's going to have to get used to the fact that the lines are far narrower, that he's going to receive a little bit more pressure on the ball. Um, but Ecuadorian football is not Brazilian football. It's not as good as Brazilian football, but it is very intense. It's very fast. It's very physical. Ecuador has some great athletes and the midfield is um, a little bit less tactically disciplined in Ecuador often, but there's a lot of great athletes with great technical ability. So he's coming from a league where a lot of the game happens in midfield and he's the one guy on the field who seems to have time and space and have, have composure. Um, there's a lot of players playing sharp, smart passes, but Moises seems to have more time and space than anyone else. So. I think his ability to find space, his ability to resist the press, um, suits him suits this this league very well. So I think whereas Palistri is going to have to learn how to adapt his game, um, as you mentioned, he's not the tallest, he's not the most explosively quick, although he's very sharp with his feet. He's going to have to learn to adapt, and that will take six to twelve months in the under twenty threes, maybe alone, and then we'll see where we are. Maybe he comes good. He has the ability. Whether he can um, adapt that to the English football is a different question. With Moises, you could set him out there and say, go and be a midfield destroyer, chase the ball down, and he'll run all day. He'll use the ball well, and he'll keep really good tactical discipline. You can give him creative roles as well. Now, that's the thing. Whether he'll immediately come in with the confidence to take the big risks that, that he does and still maintain that high pass completion is tricky. But I think a midfielder like Moises, I mean, basically, there's nobody else I've seen at this age coming from South America um, who has such incredible maturity and game intelligence. Like He looks like a veteran. If you if you see him play for Ecuador, you see him play for Independiente de Valle, you would immediately think he's late 20s and he's the kind of veteran of the side. He, he makes everything look easy, but he's got great energy. And look, I mean, he's... He's the player that the South American journalists have been most excited about, um, not only because of his ability and his intelligence, but he's coming from Ecuador. He's coming from this great academy that does so much so well. And they focus on the players, uh, you know, personal development. It's, it really is an incredible academy. This is, you know, the Ajax of South America, whatever you want to call it. This is this is a better academy than the, than the Flamengo has or. Boca Juniors River. This is this is the elite level academy, um, and he's the best of the bunch. But there's plenty of others coming through there as well. So um, yeah, no, I, I think everything about this deal looks looks ideal, and the the fee is, is ridiculous. Um, I, I actually know I actually know that the the City Group were looking at him very seriously as well. Um, they wanted to take him to to New York initially, um, but obviously the potential of going to Manchester United directly. Um, comes with its own challenges. Obviously, there, there's no, uh, you know, there's no stepping stone there. It's it's, it's all or nothing in a way. Um, but I can understand why it's such an attractive option for the player. Um, and this commitment for Manchester United to take him straight in across to, to England, I think also will be encouraging. Now, I just hope he gets minutes because I, I think he'll he'll shock people because he, he really is that good. Very exciting, Simon. Simon, let's talk about the, the work permit changes because we spoke a little bit yesterday, didn't we, about it? And you you said to me that you spoke to the Man United or you've seen the Man United South American journalist, uh, sorry, scout uh, quite a lot recently. It seems that United look like they're going to go and, and this, this makes me happy as a United fan. I don't want us to always go out and go and buy the next Galactica. I want to see us go and develop players, the, the best young talents, you know, from South America, from Europe from wherever in the world and bring them in and develop them and then see them pushed into the first team. So the work permit changes, talk to the listeners a bit more about that because this is quite significant. Uh, you don't really see United going and big clubs being able to go to South America and going going and getting the best young talent at this age. Because usually what happens is they go to Porto or they go to uh, you know some somewhere in Portugal or, or Spain, smaller club, they develop or they go to Belgium and then they get sold to a Premier League club for... 40 to 50 million euros. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously then these clubs are making a lot of money. So this this will have a big impact on the smaller clubs in Europe that go and buy these players directly and then sell them on for a fee. But what does it also mean 
for the British clubs, can you see them going now into South America, going directly and buying these players at a young age and developing them? Yeah, it's it's huge. It really is. And not only... Yeah, so obviously this is related to, to the Brexit uh, decision and, and the, the changes related to Brexit. Um, it basically means, uh, obviously, free movement within the European Union will end. The UK will no longer be part of the European Union. So European Union players no longer have the opportunity at 16 to move anywhere within the European Union. So one thing, it means that clubs in England will find it far more difficult to bring over 16, 17, 18 year old Spanish or 16, 17 year old Spanish players, French players. So that's going to be a huge difference as well. The likes of Cesc Fabregas, he moved to England at what, 16 years old. He won't be able to do that now, not in the same way. Now, clubs can find their way around these rules, as we've seen. Um, in, it's a bit of a grey area. You bring over the parents, you give them a job or whatever. Like, that's um, that's a way Barcelona have done it in the past. And that's something Barcelona have been punished for in the past if they, if they get it slightly wrong. So there will be, in exceptional cases, opportunities for clubs to kind of skirt around these rules. But as a rule, you would expect Manchester United to bring far fewer 16-year-olds over from mainland Europe, which is interesting in itself. Also, the work permit rules are very interesting. Now, people who've been looking at them have had to look at them twice going, okay, really? So the situation means that if a player in South America has played one under-17 international in a competition, it can be five minutes off the bench at, under seven, at 16 years old, and they've played one game in the Copa Libertadores, they can get the work permit to go to Manchester United from any country in South America. The Copa Libertadores. That's, that's a huge difference. The amount of times, Simon, mm -hmm. that you hear about these really exciting players from South America and they can't come to England because of the work exactly. permit. And this is the, this is because the Copa Libertadores, uh, basically a player has to get 15 points. The Copa Libertadores, one performance, one game in the Libertadores is seven points. One youth international is seven points. So they're almost already there. And if you're registered to a club, then you get points depending on the league that you're registered in. So that means, uh, so for example, Colombia is in tier four of these points. So, so you know, one Colombian, one Colombian league performance, one Colombian U17 international game, and one Copa Libertadores game, and you're well over 15 points. So what this means is it's not just the quality of the player and the profile of the player. It's if they've played a youth international and they play for a big club, then they can move. Youth internationals are huge. So this is going to mean that whereas, to say Colombia, for example, whereas right now, maybe there's 20, 25 Colombian players in the world who could get a work permit to move to England, in a week and a half's time, that may be a thousand. So it's going to open up everything. There will be League One teams signing South Americans. Um, there will be championship teams signing South Americans. Um, and if you look, and it's going to make a huge impact on the market, I don't think it will change Brazil and Argentina a lot because those players can usually find a work permit. They have, they're have they playing for nations that are very highly ranked. So that kind of, you know, there's ways around it. But what it will mean is youth internationals from Ecuador, from Colombia, from Venezuela, from Paraguay, from maybe Peru, Chile, these guys are eligible for a work permit. And these guys will be playing for clubs where they may be earning £1,000 a month. So the championship, even League One, is a very attractive proposition. And obviously the Premier League is, you know, is the, the, the league that most people in the world want to play in. Um, so if you do well in the championship, you go into the Premiership. If you do well in the League One, then you can go to the championship. So suddenly it... It's, for example, to, to put it very bluntly, it's easier to go to a League One team or a championship team than to Holland now. And Holland is traditionally seen as the destination. Whereas in Holland, the work permit rules uh, is that um, non-EU players have to be earning, uh, I think, one and a half times the average wage of the league. So you have to come in on a good wage. And that means only really Ajax and Feyenoord and PSV can sign South Americans. Whereas in England now, that the, the situation is hugely different. So I, we will see which clubs are progressive and willing to take a little bit of a risk. And, and I think we'll see, but I think they might be rewarded for that. So there's 
um, the likes of Brentford, the likes of Sunderland, these kind of teams are now looking. We can take a kid from the local Sunday league team, uh, you know, bring him into our academy, or, and we can take a, a League One player who's done all right, or we can take a under-20 international from Ecuador on the same money. Or, you know, <laughs> so we'll and, also, and also to sell them on, Simon, mm -hmm. because financially this could be massive. You, you look at, we're, we're going to be impacted, COVID with no fans. If clubs are able to go into, let's say, Sunderland or even Brentford are fantastic, the way that they do their recruitment, their whole data analytics. I mean, they're one of the best around. I think mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a great little project there. I don't live too far from Brentford. But, um, you know, going into South America, getting these really, let's say they get a Caicedo, for example, and he absolutely kills it in the championship. All these Premier League teams are going to be going to try and buy him. I mean, you could probably add what? It could, let's say buy him for 5 million. You could probably say 30 million because you looked at Ben Rama who went for around... 30 odd or 20 mm. 25 to 30 odd so then that opens up a brand new sort of it sounds silly but you know the buying selling thing and you mm. can see these championship clubs really benefiting and thinking right i'm gonna buy a player develop and sell yeah and look moises is is expensive in the south american context he's a absolute bargain for man united but what we're looking at is transfer fees of 150 grand 200 grand and literally by joining a championship club the player's value will be over a million. Because if, if he's a South American international, youth international, who's good enough to go to play in England, then the perception of his value is much more than they pay for him, you know, just by signing him, which means the South American clubs, what they'll look to do, I imagine in many cases is they'll say, okay, we'll let you have him for hundred grand, but we'll want, we want 25% of the future sale. So, They've now got a stake in a player who's worth millions when previously all they could do was sell him for 200 grand, 300 grand to another South American nation who would then sell him to Europe or they'd sell him to the US. Or So this is a massive opportunity because if it's a U20 international who's moved to England, then his value and the perception in the market is his, he's incredible, you know, he's much more valuable, he's much more expensive. So... I don't want to say you can't lose because in all these things you can lose. But if you buy from Ecuador or Venezuela, it will be really hard to lose. <laughs> like you'd have to do it, get it really wrong to not make at least your money back. Right. This is this is huge. I mean, I don't think I mean, I didn't know this until I spoke to yesterday. And obviously today I had no idea that, uh, you know, this was the opportunity. And I'm sure for me, it seems like the clubs are a bit more shrewder who are thinking about the, the sell on. I think they'll be the ones to take advantage. I think the ones that, uh, you know, go for the big signings won't be. But final thing, Simon, before we wrap up, you are also an agent. So talk, that, talk about that a little bit. And um, there was a player you mentioned yesterday. I can't remember. Another Ecuadorian player. Um, is he one to look out for as well? I think is it Andrea or something? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I actually work. So I, I work with an agency on the scouting and the recruitment side of things. So I, you know, I look into players and, and there's a lot and there's a lot. And uh, I'll be honest, we're, we're now talking to a lot of English clubs. Previously, um, previously for South American focused agents or clubs, you know, you would have once every couple of years, maybe you have a player who's eligible to go to England. Because there's a lot of things that need to align. They need to be have the in, the first team internationals required to get the work permit. They need to be at a price which would you know justify the risk involved, um, and they need to be good enough to come in and do a job. So to get those three things to line up um, is difficult. And the very best players go to Real Madrid and go to Barcelona. So. The work permit rules meant that it was it was hard to justify for many clubs, and it meant that South American agents and clubs had English had English contacts, but didn't expect to use them very often. To put it to put it bluntly, you know, maybe one day we'll get to speak to that club that we met we met a few years ago, and we'll have the right player at the right time. Now that's different. Now suddenly the English clubs are coming to South American clubs and representatives and scouts and saying, okay, now actually, you know, we, we spoke before, but now let's really speak, right? This is something we can do now. Um, it's very different. So I think I think this will there'll be a lot. Um, and as I say, particularly the championship. The, the the championship for me seems the perfect place. It's a big league. The money in the championship 
is better than the money in many other top flight divisions around the world, big top flight divisions. Um, there's a lot of games. Clubs need a big score. The, physic the physicality as well, Simon. You know, mm -hmm. if you want, uh, if you want to see if a young player's got it, you know, go and go and play in the championship, go and get knocked about a bit because that will put you in good stead for the Premier League. Well, yeah, exactly. And and I think depending which area of South America you're looking at, what you can find, I think for me, the players who will be most interesting to championship clubs are wingers and fullbacks who are incredible elite level athletes. It's a, it's a good start, right? If you're if you're quicker and stronger than everyone else, and and particularly the the the, the Pacific coast of South America from Ecuador, Colombia, you have some incredible athletes. You know, very very quick, powerful players. Um, those kind of guys, I think, are an easy sell to these clubs. It, you know, we're going to bring in your fastest and your strongest player. You know, that's that's going to be something that's going to be attractive. Um, and then you're talking about very great, you know, dynamics, uh, midfield ball winners. Um, I think those are the positions. Strikers, obviously, if they've got goal scoring pedigree, then it's a, an easier sell. And centre backs, I think there's some adaption in terms of position. But again, we're talking about um, great athletes. Uh, right now, Colombia's under 20 central defender is, is very interesting, Jason Mosquera. He's very similar in some, in many ways to kind of a, a Davinson Sanchez in terms of his physicality. Um, and he would be uh, an option for a championship club. And I think that's the kind of thing as well, that kind of player. Um, if they're in the U20 national team, which may be delayed in South America to the second half of the year, which is usually in February, uh, which may impact some of these moves as well, because some of these players will require one or two under 20 internationals to get the work permit. So that may shift the market a little bit and push people towards the summer in terms of making these moves. But yeah, I think I think things are going to change a lot. If if you look back, for example, Man United have signed a lot of players from Sweden. In the past, you know, there's Blomqvist and there's been a few guys from Sweden. Sweden have been hit quite hard by this in terms of UK work permits because their league isn't considered one of the higher tier leagues. So that's going to impact negatively on parts of Europe or make it far more difficult for certain countries in Europe. If there's a comparable league in South America that's suddenly seen their work permit prospects increase massively, the, the, the European Union leagues have seen their opportunities to sell to England massively decrease as well. So it's going to shift the market. There's, South America has already, always had value, but now some of these systematic legal uh, hurdles have, have been knocked down so we'll see what that does for everything fascinating simon thank you very much mate for joining me today where can all the listeners find some of your fantastic work yeah so on twitter at uh world uh, at simon edwards saf i also do podcasts uh, and content on south american football for world football index so we've got some player profiles we've got a profile on moises caicedo as well um that my colleagues did a few months ago uh, and there's an article as well on him so we've been hyping him up for seven or eight months now uh, and he's very exciting so I, I look forward to seeing how he does absolutely brilliant what i'll do to all the listeners simon is i'll get that link for you and we'll put that under the post so the listeners can also check that out simon thank you very much for joining me today it's been an absolute pleasure as always hopefully you'll be back on when we find another south american gem that's going to be possibly joining man united to all the listeners make sure you hit the like button hit the subscribe button have a lovely christmas we will be back on boxing day for manchester united versus leicester so that'll be the masterclass tactical podcast my name is Heydar Abani, and i will see you next time <laughs>